All right, welcome. In this video, I'm going to be working through the practice problems for test five for AP Pre-Cal. And this is all about like, you know, algebra of functions, composition of functions, inverse functions, transformation of functions, and even in odd functions. And you know, this is a good practice set, but as always, you know, you're going to want to be reviewing the quizzes from the unit as well. One thing I will add to that, um, I was having a conversation with somebody, you know, after the last test, um, and we were looking at the problems and students told me that they didn't seem familiar. I was like, what do you mean they don't seem familiar? And we looked at the notes book and we found that sometimes there were problems that were on the test that I didn't get to in the examples in the lecture or whatever. And, and those were really important because they were on the test too. Um, and so at the end of this video, I'm going to be going back and working some of the ones from uh, the various notes from throughout the unit that I think are going to be relevant to us. Um, okay, so but I'm just going to start off with these you know, 12 or 13 problems here. So f is given by f of x is x to the 3 plus x. Which of the following statements is true and supports the claim that f is an odd function and not an even function? Okay, well, I think, hmm, okay, as far as odd function, I think what we just need to do is translate that into, you know, its, its definition. And that's that f of negative x is equal to the negative of f of x. That's something we're expected to just know. So really we need to be seeing opposite insides and opposite outsides, opposite inputs and opposite outputs. So I think that's gonna be answer choice D. Um, yeah, because A, yeah, that, I mean, maybe, but that would mean that f of zero is equal to zero. And that does not guarantee that f is gonna be a non-function. That was actually kind of a subtle answer choice there. But I think D is, is more obviously the better answer choice uh, for you as the student. Uh, a is not a valid answer choice. It, it doesn't guarantee that it's not an even function. But, you know, I could see somebody kind of being confused by that. So for the function f, it's on the f of 3 is 0 and f of 6 is negative 4. G is given by f of x minus 4. So which of the following must be a solution to g of x equals 0? Well, that would be like saying, well, g of x is f of x minus 4. I'm just going to take them at their word and say f of x minus 4 equals 0. Now, the only thing I know that's a solution for f of a thing equals 0 is f of 3 equals 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this and I'm going to say, all right, well, that means that x minus 4 has to equal 3. And you can definitely think about this in terms of transformation as a functions, but I think that this is actually a really good example to show you why x minus 4 on the inside serves to shift your graph right for units. Okay, because if we're thinking about the 0 and tracking the movement of that 0, well, it went to the right by 4. Okay, we could solve for it algebraically. Either way, it's kind of like the same machinery at play. Uh, number 3 is talking about okay, f of x is x plus 2. If f inverse of n equals 4, What's the value of n? Okay, now, on one hand, you could say, all right, that's just going to be f of 4. If you understand how the, you know, how the relationship between inverse functions and regular functions. But if you are in my class and you're like, okay, f inverse of n, that's where f of x equals n. And so that's x plus 2 equals n. And then you get the solution x equals 4. This is very backwards from how we usually do it. But, you know, we're going to say x equals 4, because x, you know, that's the, the value of the inverse function that it returns is, is the x-coordinate that gets you that output, okay? And so that's either way, I'm going to be saying 4 plus 2 is 6. Uh, that one's tricky. I really like that one. I wish that I had seen that one and uh, been able to use it on the test. That one's kind of regrettable. All right, next we've got uh, function g with domain negative 6 to 12 h of x is 3 times g of x over 2, what's going to be the domain of h? Um, I think I'm just going to look at this and be like, all right, well, what happened to the x's? Well, you know, I got replaced with 1 half x. And if I replace x with 1 half x, that's a multiplicative transform, that's a dilation. Working on x is going to be horizontal, and multiplying by 1 half is going to serve to dilate by a factor of 2. That 3 on the outside, that's only going to serve to vertically stretch the graph, right? It's not going to impact the domain at all. So if I'm horizontally dilating by a factor of 2, and I was, actually, I think it would be yeah, good. 
thing to remind you about. If that's zero, and, you know, maybe this is negative six, and that's positive 12, and I go and I horizontally dilate, you know, this thing, I'm horizontally dilating around, you know, x equals zero. And so I'm just going to go twice as far away from zero. And so if I horizontally dilate by a factor of two, this is going to go out to 24. I didn't expect that, but that's, that's fine. Um, that'll be 24. That'll be twice as far out. And then this will also go twice as far out. And I didn't draw this very accurately, but it'll go from negative 12 to 24 is what I'm saying. And so that's going to be answer choice B, and I'm just going to move on. All right, this one. Now, I remember seeing this one in AP Classroom, and i got to be honest, I didn't love this one. Um, let's see what's happening here. Okay. I think that there's this, uh, looking at the answer choices, it's pretty much going to be, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That I can eliminate to figure out, is it just going to be two dilations or is it going to be two dilations and a shift? Okay. The first thing I noticed personally is the top of the graph. Okay. It went from two up to five. Okay, and that's probably a vertical dilation, right? I mean, I suppose it could be a shift up, like a vertical dilation by a factor of two and then a shift up by one to get from two to five. Fortunately, that is not one of my options. Okay, these are all both minus one. Oh, but I guess three times two minus one could potentially work. The only one that... Oh, no, I can't eliminate any of them based off that. I remember not liking this problem the first time I saw it. I'm not liking it much better now. Um, okay, now I guess we're going to have to think about the, oh, this little squiggling point. Maybe that's what we're supposed to look at. Was here, and now it's there. Yeah, I think that's, that's kind of going to be the key. And, yeah, it's not going to be left one, down one. I do think it's going to need to be down one. Um, and I think it's going to be, okay, it's pretty clearly horizontally dilated by a factor that's less than one because it got narrower. I think it's going to just be, um, okay, yeah, because also, let's look at this one. That, that This one supports my hypothesis that we got horizontally dilated by a factor of half and then shifted down by one. Yeah, okay. So that's what I'm thinking. Vertical, okay, so horizontally dilated by a factor of half. That gets rid of this one and that one. The fact that I think that there's a shift down by one is going to eliminate A, and that's going to be C. This one was very tricky. But all in all, I don't think it was really all that bad. Um, you know, now having actually worked all the way through it, um, you, just, you couldn't just go off the maximum. And that's, you know, that's probably good advice in general. You're not going to just be able to go off of one point on these problems. They're not going to be that easy. So tables give the values of functions f and g at selected values of x. What's the value of g inverse of f of 2? Well, I think first step is going to be find the value of f of 2. Okay, looking at the table, f of 2 is equaling negative 1. All right, now I'm interested in taking g inverse of f of 2. So that's going to be g inverse of negative 1. Now, when we see that, we want to say, all right, where does g of x equal negative 1? And that's going to be right here. And we backtrack to the x that got us there. That's x equals 10. That's going to be g inverse of negative 1. So that's what I'm looking for. That's answer choice D. Let's move on. All right, now this one is talking about, here's the function. What's its in, where's its inverse? And so what I'm going to recommend doing um, on this one, because I just worked a similar multiple choice problem like this, uh, and this strategy worked really well for me. I'm going to think about the x-intercept and the y-intercept. Um, actually, maybe I'll use two different colors for that. might be smart. Okay. And this is going to be very approximate. But I'm going to have the point 1.3 and 0, and also the point zero and negative 1.5. I'm just making numbers up for that, but it's presumably I should be able to find, you know, a graph that just has the reverse of that. And although I don't like thinking about inverse functions this way, I recognize that you as an AP pre-calc student need to solve multiple choice questions, and you want to do it as quickly as possible. And 
as a result, I'm going to say, hey, I'm looking for F inverses graph to have the points 0, 1.3 and also negative 1.5 and 0. And honestly, it's how I solved the multiple choice problem that I solved earlier today um, was by doing that, that thing that I'm, I'm not going to say out loud. So I'm um, looking for x is 0, y is 1.3. That has a negative y-intercept. This one looks believable. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably going to be B, uh, but let's just, you know, get rid of the other options. 0, 1.3, yes, has a positive x-intercept. That one's out. All right. This one has pretty much all the pieces, or like the pieces I'm looking for, 0 and 1.3, negative 1 1.5 and 0. And I would not go off the fact that uh, it looks like the one that's closer to 1 is, is on the left. Uh, we're going to need another point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, yes, I'm going to just grab some other point, uh, maybe 2 and 2. So if 2 and 2 is on the graph of f, that means f of 2 equals 2. That means f inverse of 2 has to also equal 2. And I'm looking for a graph that goes to the point 2, 2, and that is only answer choice b. So I can confidently eliminate d. If you can get it down to 50, 50 in the long run, that's, that's going to be all right in AP Pre-Cal, right? Um, if we can get more multiple choice questions right than wrong, we're on track to get credit. Um, but I don't want you to be like certain and confident well on your answer choice. And so I want you to be able to eliminate that last one. All right, now this one's a good problem. Uh, I can see like I can see the pre-calculus in this one, really. Um, so they're telling us area is equal to pi x squared. And I think the reason they did x is they just didn't want to be so obvious here. But, you know, you took geometry. It might have been a while ago, but you took the class. A is equal to pi r squared. And if you read the statement of the problem, basically what we've got is we've got a circle that's growing, right? It's a ripple in water. So the radius of the circle is increasing. And this is, like, this is basically an AP calculus problem minus the calculus. Um, and, you know, when we... When we do related rates next year, we won't actually be dealing in that t variable at all, but that's the whole other discussion. But um, basically what I'm saying is that this r right here that I wrote down the radius, that's just going to be r of t. And so I'm going to plug in. And so this is, you might be like, what does this have to do with the less, or the unit or the chapter we've been studying lately, at, you know, like composition of functions, inverse functions, stuff like that? This is a composition of functions. Maybe because I have a of x equals pi x squared, and I want a of r of t. So pi r square root of 2t plus 1 squared. Okay. Uh, of course, that's not one of our answer choices. We would love that, but that's just not, not it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to square. Okay. The pi is not going to get squared because only the 25 and the square root are getting squared. If I was to, you know, multiply that by itself twice, I would have two copies of 25 and then two copies of the square root. But two copies of the square root is just going to be 2t plus 1. All right. And then 25 times 25, that's 625. My, yeah, that's not a calculator question. I think that's uh, I think that's arithmetic you're expected to know in this class. Multiplied by 2t plus 1. And then I think from there we would be able to recognize that it's, yeah, it's going to be answer choice B. Okay, C and D still have a square root in them. They're out. Okay, A, I think that would be if we didn't, yeah, if we didn't square the 25. If we made the algebra error of, of neglecting to square the 25 and only squaring the square root. Number nine, nice old-fashioned composition of functions. Oh, but it's three layers. That's I thought that had been noticeably missing um, from the stuff I'd seen. I wish we'd done one of those. I can always see good stuff on these progress check questions. G of one is equal to two because of that point I'm emphasizing on the graph of G. All right, we want F of F of G of one. So I'm gonna say F of two is my next step. That's gonna equal three right there, that sharp corner. And then I want f of f of g of 1, so that's going to be f of 3 is going to equal 4 right there. And so that's going to be 4 like that, and I'm just going to move on. Okay, we 
got a piecewise linear function, g of x equals 2x, which is the graph of the composite function. I like these. Um, I never had a good collection of these until this year with AP Pre-Cal. Um, thinking about the composition of functions uh, together with transforms, I really only realized that you could do that last year when I was teaching algebra 2. Uh, that was kind of the approach I took. But f of g of x is going to be f of 2x, right? Just because they, they gave me this formula right here, so I should probably use it. Okay, f of 2x, I have to think about what that means on the graph of f. That's going to be, you know, multiplication on x, it's going to be a horizontal dilation by a factor of 1 over whatever I multiplied. So that's going to be 1 over 2. So I'm looking for something to get crunched. So basically, this point needs to go to x equals 1, and that point needs to go to x equals 2. And so I am going to look for the graph to end at x equals 2. And that is only happening down here with answer choice D. And that was a pretty easy problem if you knew what to do. Um, I would also point out, did they have, yes, okay, they had, a, okay, answer choice C. I want to talk about answer choice C a little bit because, you know, this problem could have easily, instead of saying uh, y equals f of g of x, they could say which one is y equals g of f of x. And I think I'm going to want to show you that one as well, um, because that's you know just as valid, and that would be a good extension of this problem. Well, g of x is 2 times x, so it's going to be 2 times f of x, where in this case the parentheses around f of x means multiplication, not composition of functions. Um, but 2 times f of x is going to be a vertical dilation by a factor of 2. Okay, and in that case, we'd be looking for something that went uh, twice as high and twice as low, so the flat part would be at negative 2 instead of negative 1, and we'd go up to 4, and that would have been answer choice C had they asked us for g of f of x. Oh man, this is another one of these backwards inverse function problems that I really wish I had noticed sooner. Um, so, f of x equals log base 2 of x. You know, this one, I haven't actually solved for any inverses in this video, so I think I'm going to just do that. Uh, if you see that this is talking about like solving a value of the inverse function, that this is just going to be f of 8, good for you. That's great. But what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to just you know, find g, just like actually robotically and be like, oh, g is f inverse, I must need to find that. So if I want to find f inverse, I'm going to y equals f of x. I'm going to solve for x. And then I'm going to say, all right, that's, that's f inverse. Okay, now f inverse of x, I would need to substitute x for y. That's going to be 2 to the x. And so that's g of x. Okay, then, if they're saying, all right, g of k equals 8, we just did composition functions. We know g of k equals 2 to the, everywhere you see x in the formula, replace it with k. And that needs to equal 8. And so I say, what value of k makes this equation true? That's going to be equal to 3. And, you know, kind of like that, because that didn't require us to take the log of a number. We just had to know that log and exponential were inverses. I'm not sure, that's probably not what I would do if I was solving this question I was taking this multiple choice test, but, you know, I, I think that's good. And I needed to show you, I did do at least one example of computing an inverse function. Because you know that's something you're going to have to do multiple times on your, you know, upcoming test, um, is, is you actually find the inverse of a function. So, f of x is given, which of the following points is on the graph of f inverse? Well, let's think about this. I, I feel like this problem needs a little bit more. I think I would like it a lot more if they said f is a logarithmic function. Because there are non-logarithmic functions that have that vertical asymptote and go through those two points. Um, I think this one might be a reject. Um, be why it's on the progress check, but that's all right. It's still a good question. Um, you know, obviously, you know, if these are points on the graph of f, 
and I want to think about points that are on the graph of y equals f inverse, I'm going to say, all right, the point 0, 1, the point 1, 4 are both going to be on the graph of f inverse. Oh, no, that's not an option I've got. I think what we're going to do now is we're going to, you know, conjecture, because it looks like a log function and the inverse of a log function is exponential, it seems to me like f inverse of x is equal to 4 to the x. And 4 to the 2 is equal to 16. Um, 4 to the 8 is not equal to 2. 4 to the 16 is not 2. All right. Um, well, I guess that if the pattern kept going, then this is definitely true. Um, I think. That would, I think that would fix the problem. Uh, but I'm just going to move on. Oh, that's it for these uh, review problems. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip back over to the notes book. I'm going to start with 5.1, and I'm going to go all the way through 5.4, and I'm going to work some examples. All right, so here I am at the book. So, you know, we started off with composition of functions. Then we did inverse functions, we transformed functions, and we talked about even and odd functions. Okay, semicircle graphs, um, that uh, was something I wanted to throw in there. Um, you've seen on the quiz, there's a, there's a function that we find the inverse of that it turns out is a semicircle. That's not like going to be a big uh, thing you need to study for for the test, of course. Um, I might need you to find an inverse of a function that whose graph is a semicircle. Uh, but I'm going to just kind of scroll through here. These are all the standard examples. I'm looking for the extra examples. Um, that we may not have gotten to think about this. All right, I got one for you. Um, this is not exactly in the notes book for, for 5.1, but I saw this notation, that this circ notation right here for f of g, and I remembered, I was like, I thought we were supposed, I thought that we were gonna see that in the progress check questions, um, but I maybe I just skipped right past it and just read it and didn't even realize that that was something y'all needed to be worried about. Um, this is a notation we need to be aware of. Okay. I made sure to use this notation once on the test, right? So that you, I am sure that you know what's going on. I don't, it's not on this, you know, exact same problem uh, that I'm thinking of right here, but I thought this would be a good time to do oh, just a little bit of composition, right? That was the first lesson. Uh, Y'all were very good on that, it seemed like. So I'm, you know, feeling confident about your ability to do that on the test. Uh, but I just wanted to remind you about the notation. Remember, this means f of g of x. Right, with g on the inside. Just read it like f of g, where that circle means of. So f of g of x is going to be taking f, and wherever I see x in the formula, replacing it with g of x. In parentheses, pardon me, squared plus 5. And we have a formula for g of x. That's going to be x minus 2 over 2x squared, and then plus 5. Okay, when I go and I actually square the x minus 2 and the 2x, okay, I'm going to need to be a little bit careful. I'm going to need to square both of them first of all. Okay, and when I square the x minus 2, I should probably go off to the side and do a little bit of side work. Um, x minus 2 times x minus 2, going to be x squared minus 4x plus 4. So, yeah, I've still got room. x squared minus 4x plus 4. And then if I squared 2x, I'd have two copies of 2 and two copies of x. So that would be 4x squared. And then I'd still be adding 5 onto the outside. And this is an expression, but this is not like fully simplified or written in like a kind of a standardized form. So it could be that maybe the answer choices don't look exactly like that, and you would need to combine these fractions with a single denominator. So what I would do is I would say, all right, this is going to equal still the same x squared minus 4x plus 4 divided by 4x squared, but then plus 5 times 4x squared. Let's see if that's still visible to you. Divided by 4x squared. Got to use common denominator. Now that's going to be 20x squares, and but I will combine these, you know, all with the denominator 4x squared, and I'll say x squared minus 4x plus 4 
plus 20x squares, and that's going to be 21x squared minus 4x plus 4, all divided by 4x squared. And there's not going to be any way I can like factor and cancel on that, I, I really don't think. Um, and so I, I think that's going to be far enough for this one. All right, moving on to 5.2, uh, where it says extra examples. I'm going to work all the ones on this page because I didn't get to any of these in class. Okay, um, which of these accurately describes the inverse function f inverse of x? Okay, and here we've got a table for f. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, well, you know, I could just say, all right, for the inverse, the output values of f are the input values of f inverse, and the input values of f, the output values of f inverse. And, and so f inverse, okay, well, f looks like it was log, I mean, exponential, because every time x increased a set amount, y multiplied by a set amount. So that does mean that uh, f inverse is going to be logarithmic. We know that, that a logarithmic function is the inverse of an exponential function. And input values increasing by 2 every time output values triple. No, I'm seeing these input values multiplying by 3. So input values triple, that's going to be answer choice B. All right, here we've got another graph. Um, suppose G is the inverse function for F. What is G of 4? Well, G of 4 is going to equal F inverse of 4 which I would find by setting f of x equal to 4 and solving for x. So f of x equals 4. That happens at, that's going to be 3.5. So x equals 3.5, or 7 divided by 2. And I would say g of 4 equals 3.5. All right. Wait, oh, whoops, that was, no, g is the inverse function for f g inverse of 4, the inverse of the inverse. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Then here it is. Um, that's going to equal f of 4. Because g is the inverse function, the inverse of the inverse is the original, f of 4 is equal to 5. All right, the domain of g, okay, well, the domain of f was 0 to 5. Okay, so that's going to be the range of g, right? The range of the inverse is the domain of the original. And the range of f, the actual y values I'm seeing it achieve, are 0 to 7. And so that's going to be the domain of g. Then, the minimum value of g of x well, like, let's just look at the range over here. The range is from 0 to 5, so that must mean the minimum value of g is 0. If they'd asked for the maximum value, I'd have said that was probably going to be 5. And I didn't realize I was kind of writing off of the area that you could see, uh, but that, that's going to be all for that one. All right, here's a couple more good ones, um, but I think these would be good for you to try on your own. h of x is 4 to the 5 to the x. Write a formula for h inverse f of x equals 2 times 3 to the x minus 4. Write a formula for f inverse. Try these on your own with the video pause. I'm just going to bring in the answers here in just a few seconds. All right, there you go. So I went with the same four-step process as always. I said f of x is y, solve for x. x is f inverse of y, and then substituted for with x if, if necessary. You know, if the if it just asks you for a formula for f inverse, you know, I think x equals, uh, you know, some expression in terms of y, that gives you a formula for the inverse. Um, the next line where it's h inverse of y or f inverse of y, that's also an expression for the inverse. But on a multiple choice test, what you're going to see is which of these is f inverse of x, or g is the inverse function for x, which of these is a function for g of x, and it's all going to depend on x. So you need to be able to do that last step. Um, and also understand that, you know, the inverse is the type of thing that takes outputs and gives you back inputs. All right, here's another one from the notes book. Um, g of x is equal to the square root of 9 minus x squared for x being between negative 3 and 0. Write a formula for g inverse. So y equals the square root, the positive square root of 9 minus x squared. I'm going to square both sides. And that 
that's going to give me 9 minus x squared. I'm going to try to solve for x. So I will probably subtract 9 from both sides. And then I will... Wait, that was equal to negative x squared. Let's just move that around a little bit. And then say that's going to be negative x squared. Then I will multiply both sides by negative 1 and probably switch the order I write these things in and call that 9 minus y squared. And then I'm going to solve for y, or solve for x when I'm in, uh, by taking the square root of both sides. And so when I take the square root of both sides of an equation, I'm going to need a plus or minus. So plus or minus the square root of 9 minus y squared. And this is why I recommend you know just solving for x, because in situations like this, we have to make a decision. Is it the plus or is it the minus? And what we're going to do, think about it. It's an equation. It's staring us right in the face. x is equal to a positive number or a negative number. Look back at the domain they gave us. x is clearly a negative number. So I know that my actual formula I want is x equals negative square root of 9 minus y squared. Now if they, and that's going to be, that's going to be my formula for g inverse of x. I mean g inverse of y. If I want g inverse of x, I'm just going to substitute x in for y. And that's going to be equal to the negative square root of 9 minus x squared. But they want the domain of g inverse as well. Now the domain of g inverse is the same as the range of g. And now in this class, if I mean we're looking at invertible functions because we're finding inverses, um, it needs to be either the, these functions they either need to be monotone increasing or monotone decreasing on their domain. Uh, otherwise, we can't find the inverse of them. So, as a consequence of that, that does mean that we can plug the endpoints of the domain into our function, and those will give us the inputs or the endpoints of our range. I'm saying input too much, so that's going to be the square root of 0, which is 0. And then g of 0 is going to equal the square root of 9 minus 0, which is going to equal positive 9. Okay, So the range of g is going to be 0 to 9. But I know that the range of g is also this, the same as the domain of g inverse. I'm just going to put an arrow right there. Okay, that's the domain right there. All right, here we've got one that says, all right, the range of f is the positive real numbers. g of x equals log base 10 of f of x. Solutions to which of the following equations are useful in solving the equation g of x equals 3. All right, so g of x is log base 10 of f of x. And that's going to equal 3. Then I'm going to say, all right, well, if I'm trying to solve for f of x, which Clearly I am if I'm looking at these, you know, answer choices. I'm going to say I need to take 10 to both sides power. So take 10 to both sides power to get rid of the log. f of x equals 10 to the power of 3. And that's going to be 1,000. So I'm going to choose answer choice B there. All right, in the transformations lesson, I did most of these examples in class. But I'm going to do them again because I think they're just that relevant to you. So f has domain negative 3 to 3 and range 2 to 6. If g is given by negative 3 times f of x plus 2 plus 5, what are going to be the domain and range of g? I think, you know, we haven't talked maybe quite as much about transformations as we should have in this video. So I'm going to say this is going to shift left by 2. And then, you know, vertically, I'm going to need to vertically dilate by a factor of negative 3. That will involve a reflection across the x-axis. And then shift up 5. And they will need to be in that order. Yeah, Because then I just added 5 to the total. That needs to happen last of all. Okay. And so what are the domain and range? Well, the shift left is you know the only thing that's going to impact the, the domain. And so that's going to be negative 5 to 1. And um, then the range, oh, whoops. Thinking the range was 2 to 6. And I'm going to take 2 to 6. So why? 
I'm going to multiply those by negative 3. But what I can't do is I can't say um, negative 6 to negative 18. That's not an interval. There are no numbers that are greater than negative 6 while also being less than negative 18. It's important discussion in my class today. Okay, so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say negative 18 to 6. Negative 6. Yeah, multiplying by negative 3. But then I'm going to be shifting up by 5. So I'd be adding 5 to these. And so I'd probably be saying first going there and then adding 5 would be negative 13 up to negative 1. Okay, and that's going to be my range of G right here. And then over here, this will be my domain of G. All right, now, F is not explicitly given. In the XY plane, the graph of the function G is the result of a sequence of transformations to the graph of F. Vertical dilation by a factor of 7. So I'm going to just start off with f of x. Okay, If I vertically dilate by a factor of 7, I'm going to multiply the whole thing by 7. Then horizontally by a factor of 11. Okay, If I'm doing a horizontal dilation, I'm going to replace x with 1 11th of x in parentheses. Now I think it's all right because there's already parentheses there. I'm not, I'm not going to have to add another set. Um, then translating the result down by 4 units, so that's going to be taking everything I've got currently and subtracting 4 from it, and then write by 12 units. And so uh, this is where the confusion can occur. So since this is happening last, I've got all of this, and now I'm going to replace x with x minus 12. Okay, there we've got an expression. And so this is going to be a formula for g. And really, a formula is going to be an equation. So I'm going to say g of x equals 7 times f of 1 11th of x minus 12, then subtract 4. OK, keeping with that same theme, order of transforms. f and g are defined for all real numbers such that g of x equals f of 5 times x minus 6. Describe a sequence of transforms that maps the graph of f to the graph of g in the same xy plane. So if I go over here and I think about, okay, first I had f of x. Okay, I'm going to need room for lots of transforms, right? I've got f of x. And then I, I'm going to do it the right way first, and then I'll do it the wrong way. And I'll show you, like, you know, what's going to happen. So if I replace x with 5x, in parentheses, that's going to be a horizontal dilation by a factor of one-fifth. Okay, then if I, after that, replace x with x minus 6 in parentheses, which is what they've done, that means then I'm going to shift right by 6. Had I done it in the opposite order, had I shifted right 6 first, I had f of x minus 6. And then if I you know, switched out for 5x done the horizontal dilation by a factor of 1 fifth, I'd have replaced x with 5x in parentheses, and that would just be 5x minus 6. That is not the same as 5 multiplied by x minus 6. So I'm just gonna, that is not what we're going to be seeing in this class really at all. Next transform example I've got is this kind of L-shaped graph here. Piecewise linear function f is shown below. Uh, Sketch the graph of y equals f of g of x. And this is one that could just as easily be g of f of x. So I'm going to probably do both. f of g of x is going to equal well, f of x plus 1. I was like, I don't have a formula for f. But that's the whole point. I've got a graph of it. So that's going to be left one unit. Okay, so really, okay, that corner of the L is going to go to the y-axis, and it's going to still go three wide, four in the other direction, one, two, three, four, and there I've got a graph of f of g of x. It just shifted left by one. 
Um, but if I wanted to consider, you know, the graph of y equals g of f of x, I think that would be just as good and just as relevant to your upcoming experience, you know, depending on which version of a test you get. So I'm going to say g of f of x is going to be equal, wherever I see x in the formula for g, I replace it with f of x. So y equals f of x, then plus 1 on the outside. That's going to be shifting up one unit. So instead of, you know, the corner being at 1, negative 2, it's going to go up to 1, negative 1. So have that. It'll still reach to the right by 3, and then back and up to the left by 4. Um, that would be... Okay, great. Yeah, I made a line segment. Okay, um, yeah, it looks pretty good. Okay, so I'm going to say that this is y equals g of f of x, and then the blue graph is going to be y equals f of g of x. And so we need to be ready for both of these. All right, I don't think I got to do this one in either of my classes, and I definitely want you to be able to do this one. Um, I first saw a problem like this last summer, right? When I was first learning about what was going to be an AP Pre-Cal. Um, I remember thinking that this was a pretty robust problem. Okay, so it's got a bunch of transforms. We have to be careful about the order. You know, we just need to keep all this straight. So A times F of BX, then add C. So I think what we need to do is figure out the values of A and B and C based on the transforms they're telling us. All right, horizontal dilation by a factor of 3. That's telling me that B equals 1 third. A vertical dilation by a factor of 4, that means A equals regular 4. And then the last thing is a vertical translation by negative 4. That does mean down, and you do need to know that. right? If they say a horizontal translation of positive 5, that does mean to the right. And at this point in the course, you need to know that, and I won't answer that question during the test anymore. Okay, So that's why I'm telling you this right now. That's why we're working the examples. Vertical translation by negative 4, that means C equals negative 4. Okay. Then, I've got a formula. G of X equals A was 4. F of 1 third X plus negative 4. Oh, whoops. Um, that was, I, I probably, that was untrue right there. I didn't catch that because I didn't get to do this example in class. Um, all right, because they are positive constants, but did I not do this one when I recorded the notes? Nope. I definitely did it and did not notice the fact that it said positive constants. All right, all the same. So we're going to say g of negative 3 equals 4 times f of 1 third times negative 3. We'll need to do that before evaluating f and then subtracting 4. So 4 times f of 1 third of negative 3 is negative 1. All right? f of negative 1 is equal to 6, so I've got 4 times 6 is 24, minus 4 is going to be 20. You can't quite see that, but I can get that in your field of view now. Ah, there you go. All right, so what I would do if this was a multiple choice question and I was solving it, um, I'm not going to just give a sketch of the fully transformed graph. There's too much going on here, right? I'm just going to track the movement of a couple of points. I'm going to think about this one and that one. And I feel like if I can track the motion of these two points, knowing what these transforms are, I should be able to pretty easily eliminate the wrong answers, right? Because uh, if it's not just a shift, whoops, right by three, and up by 2, then, you know, if it's got some sort of squashing or di other dilation, uh, I know it's going to be wrong because it's just shifting it right 3 and up 2. So I know that I need to be able to see this point right here happening. Okay, right 3 would be where x is 5, and up 2 would be where y is 0. And then I also need to be seeing, you know, it's straight across and then it goes down this kind of corner red point here okay right three up two right three from negative two is going to be x equals one and then up two is going to be two plus two is four okay and so i would just be looking uh, to see you know like which 
of the answer choices had these key points mapped to the right spot. Now, if more than one did, I might have to look at more points and think, you know, you know what's going wrong with the other ones. But I'd say in general that that should be enough, right? These really key points, these very distinctive points on the graph, we can kind of just track their movement. All right. Uh, this one I did in class. We did it on the quiz. Still worth doing it again. Um, all right. So if it was going to be a vertical dilation, like answer choice A or answer choice B, uh, we would be seeing, you know, some whole number multiplied by x to the 3 plus 3. And that would be 3 multiplied by a number, right? And that's not what we're seeing. We're just seeing 3 staying the same. So obviously what we've done is we've, like, replaced x with something else. So I think about replacing x with what and then cubing it and adding 3 is going to equal x to the 3 over 8 plus 3. Okay, well, you can think about it as like, oh, well, you know, it's going to have to be a fraction, right? So it's going to probably need to be an x on top because it's x cubed. But the way fractions and exponents work is that I'm going to have to cube the denominator as well. So I think to myself, what number can I cube to get 8? And that's going to be 2. And so I think, oh, okay, this is just, you know, g of x is equal to f of x divided by 2. Okay, so that means horizontal dilation by a factor of 2. All right, and then this last one, you know, pattern of values of f and g continue, repeating every interval width 4 for 0 to 32. Graph of g is a sequence of dilations of the graph of function f. All right, so, oh, you know, I was thinking about this one after I recorded the video, and I think really I, I should have done more on, like, just recognizing and just kind of working it the way they told me. Thinking about that pattern, the repetition, right? What's happening is these zeros. This is kind of where I'm seeing the pattern repeat. And it's like this is the end points um, of the table and the center point. Okay, so also when I hit that with a vertical dilation, it's still going to be zero. So I can pretty easily track the movement of this point. You know, I think that this point here is you know, related to that one there. And then I think this one over here is going to be related to that one. And so I see, wait, no. Um, you know, you would think that, but it's like, oh, wait, it's, if it's a horizontal dilation, um, then probably we, it needs to be like, okay, four to two is multiplying by half, but that does work. The eight can go over here. Um, and F can become G, um, you know, if I'm, horizontally dilating by a factor of one half. Okay, and if that's the case, then that means the 10 value here corresponds to the 40. And this 10 at x equals 6, that corresponds to the 40 back at x equals 3. And that 40 at 5, that probably corresponds to x equals 10 on f. Okay, but going from 10 to 40 would be a vertical dilation by a factor of 4. All right, now moving on to 5, 4, even in odd functions. So P has a local minimum at x equals 4. Uh, I'm going to just draw you a picture of that happening. Uh, I think I'm just going to assume y is positive, and that, yeah, that's what the minimum looks like. All right, if p is even, then well, I don't really know what's happening between 0 and 4, but I know that whatever's happening at 4 is the exact same thing as what's happening at negative 4. That's what it means to be an even function. It's got that symmetry across the y-axis. So this one must be false, uh, and my reasoning would be because p has a minimum at x equals negative 4. And then if I was to say, all right, well, actually, you know what? It was an odd function after all. That means I would have symmetry across the origin, which, you know, if I have symmetry across the origin, basically I can take one half of the graph, uh, you know, either 
on the right side of the y axis or on the left side. And I can reflect it across the x axis and then the y axis, and I'll land on top of the other half of graph. Um, it's kind of an equivalent way of thinking about that symmetry. But that means that it's going to turn that maximum upside, or no, it, the original was a minimum, and it's going to turn that minimum upside down into a maximum. And so because it's an odd function, I'm going to say that that is true. All right, and the last thing I've got for you is, is this kind of set of questions here. And we had some really good discussion on these questions in my class today. Um, I, was, I really liked what I, what I was getting from y'all and, you know, what we were talking as the teachers about, about these functions. Um, it was really good stuff, and that's, that's really what the mathematics is all about, is, you know, like, what's possible, what's impossible, what do we know for sure, and what's a maybe. You know, that's really, in the big picture, you know, what this stuff's all about. It's not about formulas and numbers. Um, so is it possible for an odd degree polynomial to have a global maximum? Um, this one's a no because an odd degree polynomial, uh, it's in behavior either looks like this or like that. And it really doesn't go much farther than that. Um, okay. If I've got these in behaviors where I'm going to, one is going to infinity and the other one's going to negative infinity, I can't have a maximum, like one global maximum. Is it possible for an odd function to have a global maximum? Yes. Uh, I drew a picture of one for you in the lesson. It kind of looked like that and I need to be there um, right there there it is um, is it possible for an even function to not have a global minimum okay we kind of took the easy way out um, you know in the, with this question because uh, it's like yeah it can just you know be an upside down parabola uh, and it can just have a global maximum instead um, the question we were talking about today is is it possible for an even function not necessarily a polynomial to have neither a maximum nor a minimum. And we came up with one over x squared, and we came up with another function that kind of had like a hole at the origin and went up like that and had a horizontal asymptote that would have neither a maximum nor a minimum, and it would be an even function. Um, but yeah, it's definitely possible. I just drew you a picture of it. Um, uh, we think at least as of today, uh, that if the function's continuous and it's even, it's going to have to have a global maximum or a minimum. Um, but then the last one is, is it possible for an even degree polynomial to not have a global maximum or a minimum? No, it's got to have one or the other. Um, if it's an even degree polynomial with a positive leading coefficient, you know, it might have, you know, some wiggles and some weirdness to it. But one of these local minima has to be the absolute minimum. And if it's an even degree polynomial with a negative leading coefficient, no, maybe that's the graph is kind of looking like that. And I would have an a, a absolute maximum, but no absolute minimum. Uh, but if I've got an even degree polynomial, it must have either an absolute maximum, or you know, same thing as global maximum, or an absolute minimum. And you know, that was a pretty comprehensive review. I feel like we've gone through, we've done all of the things from, uh, from the recent lessons, all the things we need to do to prepare for the test, um, you know, if you've worked all these problems with me, I got to think that you're going to see the familiarity with problems on the test. Um, so that's going to be all for this video. Thanks for watching.